Oppression can sometimes take over and consume our lives. The definition of oppression is this, the act of oppressing, the imposition of unreasonable burdens, either taxes or services, cruelty or severity. Uh, a state of being oppressed or overburdened, misery, hardship, calamity, depression, dullness of spirit, lassitude of body, a sense of heaviness or weight in the chest. I think we all have had something in our lives at one time or another that we have felt oppressed. But I would like to suggest to you today that oppression can come from pretty much three basic areas. Number one, if you're taking note, the enemy. Satan himself and his demonic power. First Peter chapter 5, verse 8 says, Be sober and be vigilant, for your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And this is real. Number two, our bad decisions. We have oppression or consequences because of the bad choices that we have made or continue to make in life. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 says, but I say this, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, but he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 and 8 says, do not be deceived, God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, he will also reap. For he who sows to the flesh will reap corruption. But he who sows to the spirit will of the spirit reap everlasting life. Sometimes our decisions affect our lives. And number three, the world. There is a lot of drama in the world today. Would you agree? <laughs> right? And a lot of this is just because of the sin of Adam. The world is a mess and it affects us. So the sin of Adam, David, I mean, sorry, uh, Paul explains it in Romans chapter 5, verses 18 and 19. He says this. He says, therefore, by the offense of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even so, by righteousness of one free gift came upon all men justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So by obedience of one, many can be made righteous. Praise the Lord, right? John 16, says, These things I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have tribulation, right? <laughs> we don't like that word. <laughs> Especially now that Jesus said that, so we shouldn't be surprised by it, but often we are. Lord, why is this happening? I told you it's going to happen, right? I told you life is going to happen. But he says, you'll have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. In life, especially in the church, we often blame or insist that all of our oppression is really just the enemy. With our bad decisions, we are lacking in being honest with ourselves and addressing our responsibility in the process. We often spend more time justifying our lifestyle than focusing on our walk with Jesus. There are things happening in this world that we just cannot control. And those things have an effect on us. It's just life. These, they've actually created a scientific name for this. Are you ready for this one? It's called the law of entropy. Entropy is when a system involving spontaneous processes is left to itself, it inevitably deteriorates with time, and its state of disorder reaches a maximum. So we all know this. Uh, how many of you, don't raise your hands, are under 30? Right? Like the body's still working pretty good. But it's, now I'm in my mid-50s now. And there's a lot of things that my mind thinks that I can do. And my body says, no, not, you're not doing that one, right? This body is aging, it's depleting, right? And eventually, we're going to die. It's going, but things are different with the Lord, right? So, but that's the scientific explanation of what happens in life. Now, with oppression, we're going to read 
about Nehemiah, he is going to see a lot of oppression happen in chapter six. So if you'll open to Nehemiah chapter six, we're gonna look at the first two verses. In verses one and two, I'm gonna call this, thank you for giving me an extra. It never fails that when I teach, it's like somebody turned the faucet on. <laughs> Let's read verses one and two. Now it happened when Sanballat, Tobiah, Geshem the Arab, and the rest of our enemies heard that I had rebuilt the wall, and there were no breaks left in it, though at the time I had not hung the doors of the gates, that Sanballat and Geshem sent to me, saying, Come, let us meet together in the, among the villages of the plain of Ono. But they thought to do me harm. Now, the enemy, Satan, is using these guys to threaten the actual work of the wall. He did this in chapter 4. He started, he, there were threats of attacks. In chapter 5, he starts working internally. There's family problems, provision problems, where do we live problems. And now, it's another kind of attack of oppression. You see, these enemies, they do not like the fact that the Jewish people are establishing a city. They have controlled the Jews by taking their property, manipulating their families. But now a wall is built. There's protection. And God is doing something here. He's not only doing it physically, but he's doing it spiritually. But God gave Nehemiah some discernment. Look at the end of verse 2. He says, but they thought to do me harm. Now, discernment is the ability to judge matters according to God's view of the specific situation. Let me say that again. Discernment, spiritual discernment, is the ability to judge matters according to God's view of the specific situation, not according to the outward appearance of the situation. We are often deceived sometimes by outward appearances, aren't we? We should always look at the things like the Lord does. And the first example that I thought of was, remember when Samuel was getting ready to anoint a new king? He said, God told Samuel, I'm done with Saul, and I'm going to send you to a new king. And he goes to meet David's parents, right? And all the brothers there. That's in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7. It says, but the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at the appearance or the physical stature because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For the man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. As Christians today, we can suffer a great deal because we lack discernment. We sometimes follow leaders and teachers who give a good appearance, but they don't walk in the nature of God. We have accepted things blindly because it looks good or sounds good without carefully judging the situation in light of the whole counsel of God's word. Proverbs 27 verse 6 says, Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. So we have a response from Nehemiah. This has happened. Look at verse 3. He says, So I sent messengers to them saying, I'm doing a great work so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease while I leave it to go down to you? With Nehemiah's response, he doesn't get distracted. He doesn't lose focus. He gives them a statement of truth. He gives them an answer. And he leaves them with a question. The truth is, he's doing a great work, right? Remember, he's the cupbearer for the king. He has no experience in construction. Any construction people here? Right? You're getting ready to build onto your house or do something. You're not going to call the cupbearer, right? But God called the cupbearer. So he's doing a great work. And the answer, he says, listen, I can't come down. I'm not going to do it. And then he leaves a question. He says, why should the work cease while I leave it and go down to you? Because in Nehemiah's mind, he was doing what he was called to do. And if he leaves, it's not going to get done the way God has called him to do it. Now, without godly discernment, there's a couple of things that we need to understand. We can think 
A dangerous invitation from the enemy may really be an offer of reconciliation. We can think presumption is faith. Has the Lord made this clear? You know, the, one of the examples for this one and the next one, I think, is often uh, dating. So if uh, your kids are dating, you're thinking about dating, there, there's a lot of times we see some really structured guidelines about what relationships should look like, right? right? But yet, then we're in a relationship and we want to compromise. And then we try to get God, which is the next one. We think our noble desires are God's promises. And so instead of following God's plan for my life, we try to work God into our plan, right? That can be very deceptive. We can think that God is saying go when he's really saying stay or vice versa, right? We can think someone is a great person or a spiritual leader when they are really doing damage to God's people. So uh, I'm not going to take you there, but write Colossians chapter 2 down. Listen, that, that chapter is very clear about what our lives should be, what we should be focusing on, and, and exposing deception. So verse 4, he says, but they sent message, this message four times. And I answered them in the same manner. Listen, they never answered Nehemiah's question. They want Nehemiah to come to them, but remember the discernment that he has. He says, but they want to do me harm. Now, what kind of attack is this? Is this an enemy attack? Is this a bad choices attack? Or is this the world attack? Well, this is definitely an enemy attack. It's pretty easy to see. And we're going to go through at the end and kind of define how we can figure those out. Uh, but now they have a different oppression that they are going to try. And I'm going to call, call this one accusation oppression. Look at verses 5 and through 7. Then Sanballat sent his servant to me as before the fifth time with an open letter in his hand. And in it was written. It is reported among the nations that Geshem says that you, the Jews, plan to rebel. Therefore, according to these rumors... You are rebuilding the wall that you may be their king, and you have also appointed prophets to proclaim concerning you at Jerusalem, saying, There is a king in Judah. Now all these matters were reported to the, will be reported to the king, so come, therefore, and let us consult together. Now, Sanballat sends an open letter. He's inviting anyone that handles this letter to read it. And there are accusations in this letter. Anyone who, that doesn't know Nehemiah might believe what is written in that letter. See, what Sam Ballad is saying is that Nehemiah is here to establish himself as a king. He's here to take over. You don't really know this guy, where he's from, or what kind of ruler he is. So we are going to let the king know what he's, go what he's doing here. Now, we have to ask ourselves a question. This is, this is accusational oppression. Are any of these accusations true? No, none of them are true. The enemy is really good about getting us off the truth and believing something that's not true. Nehemiah, listen, he was the king's cupbearer. The king knows who Nehemiah is. But if you didn't know who Nehemiah was and you read this letter... It might sound true. And sadly, gossip spreads rapidly. The truth, not so much. So there's a couple of things. There's, this kind of just opened my eyes a little bit. There are some things in the church, hopefully not here, but there are some things in the church and in Christianity that we think are biblical, and frankly, they're not. So I'm going to lay a few of them out for you. If you want to talk about them later, if you want to quiz me on them, we'll talk about it afterwards. But number one, you've heard this one. God helps those who help themselves. Okay, that is not biblical. Listen, God will help you whenever he deems necessary to help you. And oftentimes, he will help you when you don't even deserve it. How about this one? Follow your heart 
and just believe. Well, your heart will get you into a lot of trouble, right? Because if I go by how I feel, that is not truth. But again, that's one of those things that the enemy is very good at making our feelings seem as truth. Believing. Listen, we are not called to blindly believe anything. Paul said, I know who I have believed in, and I am persuaded that he is able. 2 Timothy chapter 1, if you want to look that one up. How about this one? At Christmas time, we've got a couple of carols, and we say three wise men. The Bible doesn't say that there's three wise men. It just says there's wise men. There are three of them. I don't know where they got it. I mean, I don't know if they just buy the gifts, and they thought, well, one king brought this. But the Bible doesn't say three wise men. How about this one? Cleanliness is next to godliness. Any of you have kids know that that's not true. Right? And I think John the Baptist would probably have a little bit of a problem with that one. Uh, how about this one? God wants you to be happy. Listen, God, happiness has nothing to do with your life in Jesus. God calls us, us to be holy. Now, there's an amazing thing that happens when we choose to walk in holiness. Happiness is sometimes a byproduct. Because we are just right with Jesus and uh, things don't bother us like they used to bother us, Right? And then the, one more. This too shall pass. Now, we hope that that's true with COVID, right? But listen, when, when, how about this one? When somebody's sick and you pray for healing and God doesn't heal them. Or when somebody's on their deathbed and God does not resurrect them. Or when you're going through some drama in life and you pray and pray and pray and you just continue to be in it. Well, here's what ends up passing, because listen, God is far more concerned about how we grow in situations than the situation itself. So with that, no matter how many people say it or how many people believe it, what's happening here to Nehemiah is it's not true. And isn't it amazing how we can hear something about someone that we know very well and then all of a sudden doubt our relationship with them because of something we have heard. You've been there, right? Maybe you've been part of that kind of gossip, or maybe that's you've actually been the topic of that gossip. See, if there's a question, the question should be this. Whatever that question mark is about what's going on, then you should go to that person, find out if there's a problem, and then deal with it. It's amazing when you have a face-to-face -face conversation with somebody how things just really clear up, right? Especially when in your mind you're going, okay, wait, I know this is this person, but this person is saying this word, this about them, and it's conflicting. Well, then let's go to the person and find out what the issue is and seek the Lord and let restoration happen. But that is not what, hap that is, not what is happening with Nehemiah. Uh, Proverbs 25, verses 9 through 10 says, When arguing with your neighbor, don't betray another person's secret. Others may accuse you of gossip, and you will never regain your good reputation. Now, as we discuss this, you might be confused at the reading at the end of verse 7. Look at the, look at the end of that verse. He says, So come, therefore, and let us consult together. Now, that sounds good, but actually it is not. What is said, he says, listen, now these matters will be reported to the king. So come, therefore, and let us consult together. See, so Sanballat and Tobiah are wanting to talk to Nehemiah. So we think, well, why wouldn't Nehemiah go and talk to them and clear this up? But the statement is not about clearing up. It's a threat. It's manipulation. They did not to do, come to discuss anything. They want Nehemiah to do what they want him to do. Verses 8 and 9, he says, Then I sent to him, saying, No such things as you say are being done, but you invent them in your own heart. With that heart thing? For they all true were trying to make us afraid, saying, Their hands will be weakened in the work, and it will not be done. Now therefore, O God, strengthen my hands. Nehemiah's response again is truth without an explanation. 
With godly discernment, he again recognizes the deception of the enemy and continues to work that God has the work that God has called him to do. Now, there's an overlying theme that we get through the book of Nehemiah. I'm just gonna, I'm rattling off for you with it. In chapter one, verse four, he says, so it was that when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and I mourned for days and I was fasting and praying before the Lord. This is Nehemiah speaking. Verse five, he said, and then I said, I pray to the Lord God of heaven. Verse eight, remember Lord when I pray. Chapter two, verse four, he says, then the king said to me, what do you request? So I prayed to God in heaven. Chapter four, verse nine, nevertheless, we made our prayers to the Lord our God. Nehemiah was a man of prayer. Now, the instruction for us, let's, let's take some New Testament practicality. Romans chapter 12, verses 10 through 12 says this. Now listen, this is, no matter what's going on around us, this is how we're supposed to act in life as believers in Jesus. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love. In honor, giving preference to one another, not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer, right? Sometimes you talk to people, hey, how's your prayer life? Well, I pray all the time. But what are you praying, right? Is it just a, a complaining moment to the Lord? Or is it, Lord, I need your help. And whether you help me or not, I'm gonna trust that you're gonna work this out to do some amazing thing that is gonna bring glory and honor to you. Nehemiah prays against what his enemies are trying to do. He says, now therefore, O God, strengthen my hands. Now, there's one more oppression that I see happens in this area of scripture in verse uh, 10. And I'm gonna call this one betrayal oppression. Look at verse 10. Afterward, I came to the house of Sh uh, Shemaniah, the son of Delaiah, the son of that guy, who was a secret informer. And he said, let us meet together in the house of God within the temple and let us close the doors of the temple for they are coming to kill you. Indeed, at night they will come and kill you. And I said, should such a man as I flee? And who is there such as I who would go into the temple to save his life? I will not go in. Now, on one hand, we can just see that this is Nehemiah just being a tough stud, right? Hey, I'm not doing that. You gonna come at me? Come at me. Well, that's true to agree, but listen. He is asking Nehemiah, this in secret informer, he suggests a good idea. Hey, you know what? Maybe we should go into the temple. It's safe there. It's a good place to hide. But hiding in the temple and shutting the doors, there's a very serious problem with that. Because we cannot compromise God's word. You're in a situation, somebody's giving you a good suggestion without the filter of God's word. See, priest were the only ones allowed to go into the temple. And Nehemiah was not a priest. He would have been disobeying God if he had done what Shemaiah suggested. And that's Numbers chapter one, verse 50. He's not a priest. In 2 Chronicles chapter 26, King Uzziah, who was not a priest, decided he was gonna do some priestly things and he enters the temple and God strikes him with leprosy. Listen, this is very serious. Nehemiah knew his Bible. One, Alan Redpath about the, uh, this area in uh, 2 Chronicles, he said this, he seeks to persuade Nehemiah, and I'm sorry, this is from Nehemiah 6. He seeks to persuade Nehemiah into an easygoing, compromising religion that will shirk persecution, that will carry no cross, and that is governed by the fear and opinions of other people. And Nehemiah was going to have any part of it. Now listen, sometimes we can get there, can't we? But sometimes we get advice from people and it sounds really good. It may sound even godly. Hey, go hide in the temple. But if we do not seek God's counsel and we don't know, we could end up doing something that's going to put this in the category of bad decisions, right? 
Godly discernment appears again. Look at verse 12. Then I perceived that God had sent, had not sent him at all, but that he had pronounced his prophecy against me because Tobiah and Sanballat had hired him. For this reason he was hired, that I should be afraid and act that way and sin, so that they might have cause for an evil report, and that, that, uh, that they might reproach me. Now think about this for a moment. A minute. I, I always like to think a little backwards. I'm gonna, now, what did Nehemiah not do in all this? Listen, Nehemiah did not have a pity party. He didn't go to God and, God, I mean, I'm doing this work, I'm building this wall, and look at all this. I mean, they're just, they're, I did, uh, uh, right? Called, you know, playing the fiddle, so to speak. He didn't do that. Listen, he didn't call his friends and talk through all the persecution that he was going through and talk to a bunch of people to make him feel better. Uh, I don't know about you, but so far with these, I think I've been guilty. How about this one? God did not whine to the Lord about why all of this is so hard. See, here's why he didn't do any of these things. Nehemiah knew who he was in the Lord. He knew beyond a shadow of a doubt what God had called him to do. He trusted in the Lord and focused on the task. Now see, there's an interesting thing about Nehemiah building the wall. There were all kinds of distractions that happened. And his straight plan sometimes had to be adjusted. You know, okay, well, we got to adjust here, but the plan was always to build the wall. Sometimes we just start focusing on the problem and then we want to address the problem and we forget what God has called us to do. And then all of these falsehoods that are being said, we know that none of them were true. He didn't listen to the enemy. He listened to the Lord. Look at verse 14. My God, remember Tobiah and Sanballat according to these, their works and the prophetess, Nodadiah, and the rest of the prophets who would made, have made me afraid. So listen, this is not just a couple of people. This is some oppression that is happening. Oppression can cause depression, right? But there was something Nehemiah wasn't doing. He wasn't letting, letting it go there. Listen, that's false. That's not true. That is not what God said. I know what God's called me to do regardless of what you say. Think about this for a moment. God's pretty big, right? And if you know that God has told you to do something and you get some good advice from somebody about maybe to do it or not do it, you need to be very discerning if that's the Lord or not. Does the Lord change his mind? Not usually. He wouldn't ask you to do something and if it's not completed, change his mind. Verse 15, he says, So the wall was finished on the 25th day of Ul, in 52 days. Now, on the Hebrew calendar, that is August, September. That's one of the hottest times of the year in Israel. And these guys are out building a wall. For you construction guys, uh, no crane, no bulldozer. They're digging through rubble. Their hands, maybe a couple of tools, and building a wall. Verse 16. And it happened when all of our enemies had heard of it and all the nations around us saw these things that they were very, very disheartened in their own eyes for they perceived that this was done. Isn't that awesome? Now listen, you read through the book, we're, just, we're taking a little glimpse from chapter six, but there is a roller coaster ride of things going on here. It is not easy but they persevered and they went through and the, everybody's looking around going, hey, that, that's gotta be God. And look at those people. They can, there's no way they can do that by themselves, right? People might look at you that way. There's no way you can, how did that happen? Lord, I'm just doing what I'm told, right? All the trials, setbacks, threats, and threats internal problems of oppression against this project and in spite of this, the enemies are very disheartened. That word disheartened, this Hebrew word, it means to fall down prostrate, 
to waste away or to be inferior, right? Enemies are disheartened and nations around are seeing the hand of God. Unbelieving people are saying that this is the Lord. Get that. Unbelieving people are saying, that's got to be God. There's no other way. So the chapter closes out. He says, also in those days, the nobles of Judah sent many letters to Tobiah and letters to Tobiah came to them. For many in Judah were pledged to him because he was the son-in-law of Shechaniah, the son of Era, the son of Jehoiadan, and had married the daughter of that guy and all those other people. And so they reported his good deeds before me, and I reported my words to him. Tobiah sent letters to frighten me. Listen, Tobiah is not a Jew. He's married into the family, and he's in, he's in a leadership position in a place that he got by marriage and manipulation, not because God had appointed him. Now, there are some things that the Lord needs to deal with, and we bring them to him, and we leave them with him. God will allow you to defend yourself. Listen, God will allow you to defend yourself, but please be careful. Because more often than not, we need to allow the Lord to defend us. And that builds our faith and our trust. You know, I, I usually tell people, if I have a gym membership, I got the little card that I can scan and get in the door. And like, oh yeah, I go to this gym, but I never go. Pretty much useless, isn't it? And listen, don't be a believer that calls yourself a Christian, but you aren't willing to work out. All of you that have accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, when you did that, did your life get easy? I mean, just, oh, this is awesome, right? You know, first couple of days, and then, wait a minute, I still have the same problems I had yesterday. In fact, I'm a little more sensitive to them, and it's a little creepy. Wait, Jesus? What? what? It, that's not how it works. But, it, but then something starts growing inside of us. We start, our faith starts to grow. Our perception is different. Our views are different. There's certain places we used to go that we don't go anymore. There's certain things that used to come out of our mouth that don't come out of our mouth anymore. There's certain people we used to hang out with and we don't hang out with them anymore. And it really wasn't because somebody stuck their... Now listen, don't take it, right? We have principles in God's word that are a broad brush stroke over our lives that we just... Listen, I love Jesus and what he did for me. And that's why I don't do those things anymore. It's not because I'm ticking a box every, every morning. Okay, yeah, I read my Bible. Uh, that guy called me for coffee. He's not a believer. No, nope, not going with him. Right. Jesus said, be in this world, but not of it. He didn't say, go hide out on a mountain somewhere and kumbaya yourself to death. That's not how it works. We are to show the love of Jesus to that world out there. And you got to be in it to do it. Listen, people can say things that are not true, accuse you of things that you have done, and there's a pride that wells up inside of us because we know that those things aren't right. But when we start focusing on the things in the right viewpoint, things change. See, the three things that can happen, the enemy... Oppression, the enemy can attack us, that's very valid. Our bad decisions, we have oppression or consequences because of the bad choices that we have made in the past or even today, or there's just a messed up world out there. And how do we define those things? Here's the, here's the easiest way to define it. You're in the grocery, you're in the checkout line at the grocery store, right? And that checker's beep. Here you go. Hey, how you doing? Hey. And you hear this little voice. Tell her I love her. Now we can determine pretty quickly by the process of elimination who that is from. Right? That's the Lord. It's not me because I don't want to do that. Right? 
hey, can I just tell you that Jesus loves you? Uh, okay. Beep. <laughs> yeah. And we know that the enemy's not doing that. Right? The enemy's like, hey, tell him Jesus loves him. It was interesting uh, being in England and we talk different. Uh, it's, it, it, you know, it, it's, just, it's just weird. Because you're somewhere and all of a sudden people want to have conversations with you and they want to, they look at you and they're, oh, they're right there. And I'm not even going to try to do an English accent because I just butcher it. Because I just, I, it's, to me, it's awesome to hear them talk and they think it's awesome to hear us talk. But I, one of the girls in our church, she says, well, you say water, water, it's water. <laughs> water, water, she'll, she'll overdo it, water, water, it's water. <laughs> I don't even know where I was going now, I just totally lost train of thought. But we were in the checkout line, and oh, you're American, yeah, yeah, well, what are you doing here? Oh, well, I came to pastor a church. What? Now that, you, you came from Florida? Why would you come here? <laughs> and uh, so it, it really opens a door for conversation. You say, well, listen, and we'd love to have you join us for church if you... And this one time we're in this line and this lady goes, I don't do religion. And I was like, what? And my wife is a lot more quick-witted than I am. And she said, well, if you change your mind, our church meets at this. And, da, 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 da. and she's like... Oh my gosh, I just got shut down. The pastor got shut down. The wife, she just, well, she nailed it. But it just, it's just awesome, right? Because the thing is, people, they have this perception of what Christianity is. And like in England, it's from TV, right? Listen, you've seen Christian things on TV in here, and you look at it and you go, I don't act like that. Where do they get that? And the world is kind of really confused. And so they come up with this bad conjecture of what Christianity is because they don't see it. Right? They just hear, they, they see a, I, I, I question sometimes if they're Christian or not. You say you're a Christian, but your life hasn't changed. I, to me, there's a big question mark there. But, or some people that are just struggling and then that's what they define what Christianity is, right? They don't define it by the thing you've done that you've helped them or loved them, cared for them in any way, right? It, it's, it's like in, in sales and in, in business. You can do a hundred things right, but the one thing that you do wrong, that's what everybody remembers. And that's just what happens with Christianity. And you know what? We need to go out and change that. So three things that can help us determine, listen, is this the Lord? Is this my bad decisions or is this the enemy? It's pretty easy to define that. Now, there's three things that we can do when oppression comes upon us, and we can get it right out of this chapter. Number one, we need to have discernment. Many things will distract you from your task, and they might be good things. But now, did Jesus say, hey, I've come to give you life, and life that's just a little better than what you had before? Is that what he said? No, I came to give you life, and I want to give it to you more. If you think it's this good, I want to bring it up here, right? So we know that good is not necessarily the best. We have to have discernment. How do we get that discernment? How do we know what is true? Well, we need to know our Bible. You need to spend time in your Bible and your Bible will change your life. The filter changes things. And, and then here's an awesome thing that you can do. All of you know godly people that you look up to. You've got a pastor here that's awesome. And you, hey, I've got a question. Can we talk about something? And you explain that situation, right? And, and here's what we need to be very careful of. If somebody says to you, well, you know, I think that you should do this. I would put a question mark on that. But if somebody says, hey, you know what? The Bible says, there's, there's a story in the Bible that has that same scenario. And this is how the Lord worked that out. So maybe that would help you in making this decision. See, there's, there's not a chapter and verse about who you should marry and what job you should take. Not. Ah. But what there is are valid principles of making decisions, wise decisions. And then there's some very clear things about what you should and shouldn't do, right? One of my favorite verses, Ephesians chapter four, verse 29, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good and necessary for edification that it may impart grace to the hearers. Now, if you stuck that on your refrigerator and you live by that every day, there's a lot of things we wouldn't say anymore, right? 
there's a lot of conversations we would just avoid. Because if I can't build you up and I can't be gracious in saying it, I need to keep my mouth shut. Now, that principle can go in marriage. It can go in our relationship with our kids. It can go in our relationship with our coworkers at church, right? That applies a lot of different places. Uh, last one, continue the work that God has called you to do. Listen, you need to know your calling, know your marching orders, so to speak. Nehemiah was there to build a wall. And when you, listen, we need to do this. Spend time in God's word, spend time in prayer, hang out with believers and get the word, right?